Welcome to Book Talk. In the very centre of the Houses of Parliament, in central lobby, the walls are lined with statues of the kings of England. They're warriors, statesmen, lawgivers, and not a few villains. But one king of medieval England defies all of those categories. Henry VI was none of the above, and sometimes barely seemed to be a monarch at all. Hence the title of the new biography of him by my guest today, the historian Lauren Johnson. It's called Shadow King. So Lauren, set the scene for us. Henry was the son of another rather more famous Henry, Henry V, the great warrior king who effectively more or less conquered France, but died while his son was still a very, very small child. Yes, when Henry V died, we're about 80 years into the Hundred Years' War, and uh, he actually died never having met his infant son, Henry VI. But he had recently concluded a truce, uh, a truce with France, which meant that when Henry VI inherited the right to the English throne, he also inherited a right to the French throne. So he goes on to become the only monarch in, in history to be crowned in both England and in France. We know that lots of people during the Hundred Years' War claimed to be King of France as well as England. He's the only one who definitely is. And that, so he had that legal status, but that was probably mm. in some ways the grandest thing about him. It, it seems to be almost the classic fate of the infant monarch, the child who becomes king, that they don't turn into a particularly good king at the end. But even at the beginning of his life, he had to be sort of shown around as the symbol of the state. Yeah, even as a, a baby, he is literally passing uh, the great seal to his chancellor. He is processing into parliament and sitting in parliament. He's crowned in Westminster when he's eight and then in Paris when he's 10. So, I mean, his earliest memories would have been of kingship, of being a monarch. And yet, as you say, unfortunately, he never actually sees kingship in action. He just reads about it in books. And that gives him, I think, a slightly warped idea of what a king should be. He never really realizes that you have to be this sort of steely, ruthless individual to say one thing and often to do another. But he was surrounded by steely, ruthless individuals, not least his two uncles, who more or less shared the governance uh, of England and its French dominions as well, uh, and fought like ferrets in a sack around him. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's one of the, the big problems of Henry's youth, is he is surrounded by these warriors, effectively, the, the generation of his father, who all have very firm ideas about how England should be ruled and how France, uh, the war there, should be fought, because the war continues throughout Henry VI's life. Um, and these men never seem to agree on how things should be done. So Henry's childhood is, is just consistent conflict. Uh, adults arguing around him, sometimes violently, sometimes in front of him. So uh, an incredibly unpleasant, tense environment in which to grow up. And, it, and into this environment comes basically another child, although she doesn't seem very like it, uh, the, the teenage French aristocrat Margaret of Anjou, who is to be married to Henry and she goes over to England at the age of 14, and she is an extraordinary figure. Yeah, absolutely, she is. She's actually about 10 years younger than Henry, and she's remembered if she, uh, particularly as the she-wolf of France, uh, as Shakespeare we get all our, her. We get all our history of this really from Shakespeare, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. Henry the Holy, sort of the holy fool, really, Margaret the she-wolf. But actually, when they first meet, you know, we're talking about a teenager and a man who, although he's been king all his life, has only relatively recently taken on real power for himself. Um, and at first, I would argue that Margaret very much is just sort of parroting what Henry wants. She, she talks about the desire for peace, uh, obviously the desire for an heir to the throne because Henry has no siblings, no legitimate cousins to take on the Lancastrian dynasty after him. So for, it takes actually quite a long time for the, uh, the sort of that slightly more uh, powerful Margaret of Anjou to emerge. And probably the first point when she does is in 1450 when the English lose France effectively. And there is a huge rebellion as a result. London is seized by rebels and Henry flees in the face of them. But Margaret stays to broker peace. So already we can see within five years of their marriage, when she's still only 20, that she is starting to step up and maybe fill some of those cracks in Henry's power. What we've got here is this fascinating human drama with characters that we can't really know. I mean, how much is actually available from the, from the written sources to tell us about these people? Or are you having to read fairly carefully between the lines? You do have to read between the lines with Henry because right from 
the point at which he's nine months old. Uh, as I say, he is ruling as a king. So uh, the official documents that go out for his Privy Council, for instance, um, go out from the king and the council. Similarly, in later life, when he's 31, he suffers a, a really quite catastrophic mental breakdown for 16 months, which arguably he never fully recovers from. And during that period as well, we have the king allegedly giving instructions to people. Uh, so you have to be slightly cautious in, in weaving your way through these documents to decide when is it really Henry saying this and when is it the people around him controlling him. And I think Henry, more than most medieval monarchs, is really someone who delegates power to other people, who is very happy, in fact, to let other people do the actual ruling and the fighting for him. Uh, and he would like just to carry on sort of founding Eton and King's College Cambridge and pootling around there. Because although he seems a bit of a cipher in a lot of ways, as you say, he has these two great institutions that still exist today as his uh, monuments, Eton uh, not then <laughs> taking anything like the role it has no. in modern Britain, and King's College. Uh, so he, he, he wasn't a, a completely ineffectual figure, he did do some stuff. Yes, and, was... and in those documents you definitely can. I mean, you literally see Henry's uh, signature on documents within the archives of Eton College, uh, where he is making quite minuscule alterations at times to the design of the chapel, to how he wants these buildings to look, and also in his peace policy. I think it's very important that at the point when he's around 18 that he first starts to manoeuvre uh, for himself and control things himself. Immediately we see a change in policy towards France. He wants peace, he starts to uh, give away bargaining chips to France, the marriage with Margaret is the result of an attempt to make a peace treaty with France. So it's a completely different um, attitude towards the French position than his father had, which was very much fight them, fight them, and fight them some more. So uh, he has around him a, a kind of a military junta, really, uh, composed of his uncles and some of the other great aristocrats who are perhaps more distantly related to him. And his peace policy doesn't find favour with them, to put it mildly. And then you have this mental breakdown, and there's the classic ingredients, really, for people to start thinking, well, maybe we're entitled to the top job. And you have the fact, too, that he is the grandson of a usurper. His dynasty is not on a very firm footing. So this, this cocktail brews up when he has this mental breakdown you describe, which lasted for quite a while. Yes, so it's 1453 that he suffers what we probably would call today a psychotic break. Um, he seems overnight to... Uh, just snap effectively. He, he doesn't recognise people, he can't talk, he can't walk, he doesn't seem to, to recognise those around him, he's not making any decisions. His only child is born three months into this period of mental illness and, and Henry doesn't even realise it's happened. Uh, so a profound challenge to the government of England uh, and it's decided at that point to appoint a protector to rule the country on behalf of Henry. Uh, and that protector is Richard, Duke of York, who at the time is pretty much his closest adult male kinsman. So a potential rival for the throne. A potential rival who is thinking to himself that he has a better claim to the throne than his king. Yes, arguably, I think so. And already for three years before that, in fact, the Duke of York, while not angling for the throne, has certainly been trying to get the position of chief counsellor. Um, from those around Henry. So he is already an ambitious man. So we haven't got time really to follow all the yeah. intricate twists and turns of that follow in the Wars of Roses. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fabulously uh, complicated conflict. But Richard, Duke of York, rises up in rebellion in due course, gets killed in the process. But then you have two rival kings. You have Richard's son, who becomes King Edward, and you have Henry, uh, eventually imprisoned by Edward, so he's lurking in the tower while someone else is wearing what he thought was his crown. Yes, absolutely. And Edward IV is uh, a teenager when he takes the crown. And he is exactly, Edward IV is everything that Henry VI is not. He's this 18-year-old, virile, macho, military leader. And Henry is starting to be this greying, I think probably consistently depressed uh, individual. Um, and during his time when he's imprisoned in the tower, I think that becomes even worse. Uh, so that by bizarre twist of fate in 1470, about nine years into Edward IV's rule, Henry is put back on the throne and sort of lugged out of the tower by the people around him. And is just such an unprepossessing image to them, this sort of bearded, greying, shambling, sad individual, that it just inspires no confidence at all in the Lancastrian re as it's known. And Henry is put back in the tower 
and almost certainly murdered. Yes, indeed, and in, in, in the process of the sort of coup and counter coup in which that happens, uh, his son, Edward, Prince of Wales, dies in a battle. So there isn't a great deal left of the Lancastrian dynasty at that point, really. The, the Wars of the Roses is kind of eroding away that side of what's been a very protracted conflict. But lurking in the background even then is Margaret of Anjou, who, who's separated from her husband and carrying on the resistance. Yes, if it had not been for Margaret of Anjou, that re adeption would never have happened throughout, throughout the entire period that Henry is either in exile in Scotland and then the north of England and then imprisoned in the Tower. She has been trying to get diplomatic support for an international invasion, which finally she does when her son is 17 years old. So he's just, only just old enough to, to fight in this battle. And then he's killed. Uh, pretty much immediately. And I think uh, it's a sign, really, of how much hope she had invested in her son instead of in Henry, that as soon as, as that son is dead, she gives herself in. She uh, submits to imprisonment and never really tries to put the Lancastrians back in power again. But the, in the backwash of that particular crisis, it's clear that Henry is too dangerous to let live, mm -hmm. even as a depressed and depressing figure, that the, uh, the Yorkist side of the Wars of the Roses can't afford to have an alternative king alive and occasionally kicking. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's still an enormous amount of affection for Henry, even at this point. And we can see it after Henry is dead, because very swiftly, within a matter of years, there is um, a popular cult around Henry's uh, shrine and then around images of Henry uh, in which people believe he has become a saint. They think he is able to effect miracles, saving people from hanging, saving children who are choking. Uh, and rather embarrassingly for the Yorkist regime, one of the earliest uptakers of this new cult is the city of York. So even their own heartland are sort of still uh, very firmly attached to this kind of slightly pathetic individual. But there's no doubt whatsoever that the Yorkists had him murdered and that actually the future King Richard III was the culprit. Yes, well certainly there's one contemporary who very pointedly notes that at the time Henry dies, uh, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, as he is then, is in the tower with various others. I think, I think it is entirely possible that Richard was involved because he's already been involved in um, condemning a number of Lancastrians after the most recent battle. But ultimately, I think the responsibility for Henry's death lies with Edward IV, who is the king at that point. And I think he is just trying, like you say, to sweep up the last of the Lancastrians, to get rid of the debris and ensure that there isn't anyone who can rival him at that point. He has that ruthlessness that Henry never had. And you, you explore in the book um, that there's a legend, or a tradition perhaps I should say, that he, the, the, the actual murder took place in the Wakefield Tower in the Tower of London, and you're not so sure? No, I'm not, because I did a, a lot of investigation into this. I work at the Tower of London uh, myself and have done for about 10 years. And uh, the earliest record I could find of Henry VI being kept in the Wakefield Tower comes from the 19th century. There are guidebooks in, actually in existence before that which don't mention it at all. And uh, the sources from the 15th century, again, don't specify. They just say he was inward in the tower. Um, and I think it's just not a very sensible place to keep him. It's sort of on the outer edges, on a kind of through route into the tower in a ward. And it's just, you know, if you've got a very important political prisoner, surely you're going to put them somewhere a little bit more... Uh, secure. Secure than that, exactly. So I think he was probably further inside. Do you have a particular idea of where? Or is it... I think it's entirely possible he was in the White Tower, so that, that great big structure at the heart of the Tower of London, which is where the King of France had been kept in the past century. Or maybe the Salt Tower, which is one of the inner towers on the uh, wall route, which is where the King of Scotland had been kept a few years earlier. But certainly I think the Wakefield Tower was not the place. But the afterlife, you, you've already alluded to it a bit, uh, of, Hen of Henry the uh, Sixth, is as a kind of holy fool, as someone who is regarded as saintly and venerated for that. And that must have been a touch awkward for subsequent dynasties. Yeah, absolutely. I think for the Yorkists, it definitely was. And they initially try and clamp down on it and stop this cult from taking off. But actually, under Richard III, he realises that this has become quite a money spinner, really, uh, and decides to move Henry from the fairly modest place he'd been buried at Chertsey Abbey 